So we kind of added value to our cordwood by growing mushrooms. So I pay like 65 cents for each piece of cordwood to the cordwood cutters. And then if you work it out, I get maybe a pound of mushrooms, give or take, from each log. I get like not quite 10 bucks a pound for the shiitakes, and I get mushrooms for about three years off that log. So think of the added value of growing mushrooms on that cordwood. The cultivation of edible fungi has been mushrooming in recent years, and shiitakes are one of the most popular options for growing outdoors. There's a reason for that, as we'll learn from Steve Gabriel and Nicola McPherson in this episode of the Agroforestry Podcast. I think a missing link in agroforestry with fungi is that when we talk about trees on farms, we often aren't also talking about fungi, but inevitably if there's a tree, there are fungi. And I think there's more and more to be done about ways that we can support and elevate and encourage fungi. And so I think that's a piece that I'm excited to keep digging into. Steve Gabriel is the Specialty Mushrooms and Agroforestry Specialist with the Cornell Small Farms Program. He and his family started Wellspring Forest Farm in 2012. It's a 21-acre farm on the lands of the Cayuga, or Haudenosaunee Nation, where they grow mushrooms, make maple syrup, and raise pastured sheep and ducks. Steve's most recent book on silvopasture is a great inspiration, but if you're here for the mushrooms, you might also like the book he co-authored with Ken Mudge, called Farming the Woods, an integrated permaculture approach to growing food and medicinals in temperate forests. Would you mind telling us a little bit about what's going on at Wellspring Farm and then also the the mushroom cultivation setup and schedule that you have there? Sure. So we started, that was the first crop we had on our farm back in 2011. The, the logs actually arrived before we did. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, that was a that was one of the reasons we did it, because as beginning farmers, it was like one of the only perennial crops we could uh, cultivate and then like move with us. And we, we didn't know where we were going to land. <laughs> um, and so we've done that for, for every year since. Um, and about two years ago started adding indoor production, mostly because our customers and markets were looking for, you know, more consistency, longer season, and different varieties. Um, But we've consistently kept with the shiitakes, and I I don't have any intention to ever grow those anywhere but in the woods, because they really, um, it's, I wish every mushroom had that capacity, but um, from a market standpoint, shiitake really offers that um, consistent season, which for us is usually around the last week in May or first week in June, and it goes through sometime in mid to late October here in New York. Um, although some years I've gotten as late as like Thanksgiving with you know warming seasons and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So that that kind of connects to another question I have, you know, in in realizing that so much mushroom production these days is indoors, <clears throat> which is not what I consider agroforestry. Yeah. Um, I'm curious why you choose, and you mentioned this a little bit, why you choose to grow mushrooms outdoors and and what you sort of recommend for other people in thinking about whether they're going to be growing indoors or outdoors. Sure. I, um, for years, so initially I, I supported Ken Mudge's research project at Cornell, which is all focused on outdoor cultivation. And we basically inoculated every common wood species with every common mushroom species we could get our hands on. And, you know, the, the walk away was really that from a market standpoint, you know, from a consistency standpoint for markets, the log shiitake were really the only species that had that clear potential. There's a lot of other ones you can grow, but they just fruit kind of intermit, you know, intermittently here and there. Um, so, of course, if you have a market, you can always sell those, but it just wasn't at the kind of, um, it wasn't easy to do an enterprise budget, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. And so um, what I see in the landscape and and our program was really just focused on sort of agroforestry-based mushrooms for the longest time. But what we were hearing from the audience is that, you know, people just have different contexts. And so, so for some folks, it's really easy. The space and the material and the system really works well for what they have, you know, um, as as far as like land access or forest access at their disposal. And I think the log shiitake has the big advantage of um, not needing to control the environment and really um, not needing the buildings and the, the energy and the equipment. You know, our, we mm-hmm. can think of it as like, it's almost like an off-grid <laughs> system because mm-hmm. after the inoculation, it's just human power mostly, um, at least in our case. Um, 
so so I think it has that advantage, and I think for a lot of people that have access to those materials, that's great. Um, we started doing work in urban spaces um, a few years ago, and that was when we realized that logs are actually not that easy to come by, and space might be easier to find that is indoors, and and so we started exploring the opportunities there. So I think it's a you know a, a matchmaking process where, given the context and the goals of the producer, we can do some sense of you know well logs are probably the best for you or indoor or some combination. You know our farm is a hybrid where we find that the combination really offers us the best option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you mentioned we have this ability with shiitake. Shiitake has the ability to be a part of this regular scheduled system. Why is it that other species are not capable of that? What is it about shiitake? I think it's, no, we don't have any evidence to say exactly why that is. I think it's kind of Part of the fun is that shiitake responds to that soaking cycle, which allows it to fruit really consistently. Mm -hmm. My sense is that, um, you know, humans have a longer historical relationship, mostly in parts of Korea, China, and Japan with cultivating shiitake. And so the sort of selection process and caretaking that goes into that um, selection process and the strains that we use now are derived from those um, old systems. I think that was intentional, and I think that's where, you know, we have plenty of examples of humans partnering with, with plants or livestock and doing that process, and, and then we have this, you know, incredible high-yielding or consistent, you know, um, vegetable that comes out of that or something. But I think it's, again, mostly like spending more time with them. I think oyster could certainly be grown on logs in a more consistent fashion, but the strains that we have available to us are mostly from the sort of indoor cultivation industry. So we need some selection and breeding to find strains and develop strains that respond better to outdoor conditions and to logs and maybe even to soaking. I don't think that's out of the like capacity of oyster, certainly, to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And similar with like lion's mane, you know, we, we've fruited lion's manes on stumps very reliably in our research and on our farm, um, but mostly it's a fall fruiting mushroom. So are there strains or, or um, ways that we can encourage them to show up at other times of the year than when we actually you know, normally find them in the woods sort of growing wild? Um, so uh, I think it's about humans spending more time and, and, again, doing that research. And it might take a while to get there, right? Uh, if we've been growing shiitakes collectively for over a thousand years, <laughs> um, we can't expect it to change overnight. But um, I think it would be worthwhile to figure those things out. Yeah. So in thinking more about the, the labor inputs, um, how many shiitake logs are you managing with just human power? We're doing about 1,200. Um, and so we'll soak oh. around like 150 a week. Okay. And what kind of scaling up options are there for people who might want to go, go really big? Yeah, I think it seems like in our work with log growers, the kind of minimum that folks get into for sort of a commercial you know, venture is 800 to 1,000, and then we see people creeping up ab above that, um, depending on what their goals are. And um, yeah, we, <laughs> I, I really enjoy the activity right now. Um, and with a, you know, we have a farm employee helping us. So with a couple people, we can load and unload the tank in under an hour. So it doesn't feel, um, and we figured out, I think, also how to streamline the inoculation process, which is actually really where the labor <laughs> is really stacked. Um mm. And mm -hmm. so we get a lot of that kind of out of the way early in the season. And then the maintenance is just this every week sort of logs in and logs out of the soaking tank. So, um, so yeah, as we age or as, as injuries happen and things, um, we rely on, on having help on the farm. We've definitely talked and thought about and have utilized, you know, the tractor with some forks or something to move logs and make the lifting a bit easier and I've heard everyone that comes to classes, there's there's always someone that has an idea of how they can mechanize the whole system. And I know there's some creative, you know, ways out there to basically uh, really reduce that that hand labor. But for us personally, we really enjoyed it. And hopefully by doing that, we'll be able to, you know, keep doing it for longer, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you mentioned you you are an educator also, and you've been leading the Specialty Mushrooms part of the Cornell Small Farms program, correct? Yeah. 
what what different options are there for people who want to learn the ins and outs of inoculation, not just log inoculation with shiitakes? Um, since that's, I, I don't think, something that is really easy to share in podcast audio. I think it's much better um, to learn with hands-on experience. Um, what options are there through, through the Cornell Small Farms Program and elsewhere? Yeah, so if you visit um, Cornell Mushrooms with an S dot org, um, you'll find the homepage for that project. And, and on there, there's sort of different pages. For example, one just kind of overviewing the industry and kind of specialty mushrooms and what fungi are as a whole, because that's an important starting place that people may not be familiar with. And then we have a section on outdoor cultivation and a section on indoor. And each of those sections has um, videos that we've done to show and demonstrate those inoculations. Um, so you can see that which is a good substitute if you can't actually do it, you know, in person. Um, and then, you know, written materials, fact sheets, guidebooks, all that kind of stuff to dig into some of the details about management. Um, over the last few years, we've also developed a lot of sort of budget templates that people can download and, and fill out and start to think about what scale, if, you know, if they're thinking about a commercial enterprise, they can start to play with those numbers. And then we have um, a supplier directory on there, so you can find places to get uh, mushroom-related supplies for cultivation, and and also uh, listserv, so the place that we kind of keep in contact with folks. And anyone who's interested in cultivation can sign up for that listserv, and, and we can keep in touch about um, upcoming events and things like webinars and, and events. And, of course, a lot of things are online these days. Um, uh, we do six-week um, introductory courses every year anyway, pre-COVID and post-COVID. We'll continue to do that. But hopefully at some point we'll also start re-engaging with the hands-on work that I love to do so much with folks out in the field. Well, so the question that I, I hope we can spend a little bit of time with, my last question for you, is about this sort of bigger picture, what can we learn from, from fungi? So what, what have you, as a human being, learned from, um, from fungi themselves and from this practice of, of cultivating mushrooms? Yeah, I guess... Um, what I've seen over the years and, and just continue to be fascinated by are just like the new ways that fungi show up in my life and in the life of people around me. Um, so so our, our, our family going through some medical challenges um, several years ago, mm -hmm. you know, mushrooms showed up as this sort of medicinal um, element that really offered a lot um, in, in, in the healing process. Um, and prior to that, I'd really focused on just enjoying eating that, eating them and foraging for them. And um, and for me, you know, it all started with foraging and, and sort of just a space to get out in the woods and connect and not um, not focus on sort of always being producing things out on our farm, but just sort of the, mm -hmm. the, the wandering about and the paying attention to the ecology of, of where mushrooms grow and then, and then finding them, that feeling of kind of hunting for something and finding it has always been a pleasure. Um, and it just continues, like now there's a lot of talk about mycomaterials, um, and sort of different things that mycelium can offer to benefit all sorts of different sectors um, and, all, and offer sorts of like solutions to all sorts of different problems um, uh, in the world. But, you know, particularly to agroforestry, the thing I've been thinking about, um, we do a lot of civil pasture, you know, research on our farm and I'm really interested in that. And I think a missing link in agroforestry with fungi is that when we talk about trees on farms, we often aren't also talking about fungi, but inevitably if there's a tree there are fungi, and I think there's more and more to be done about ways that we can support and elevate and encourage fungi. And, you know, if carbon capture is is one of our goals in agroforestry, then fungi have to be a part of that because it's more and more clear that it's actual fungal networks that are really doing the work of carbon sequestration in the soil. Um, and so I think that's a piece that I'm excited to keep digging into. So we've been looking at mycorrhizal root dips, and, and um, there's some Korean farming methods that allow you to harvest um, uh, native microbes and, and fungal partners out from the woods and bring them into field systems. So we're exploring all those kind of things, and I don't know. So it just feels like every every year I get introduced. I just learned about you can make paper out of fungi um, from hmm. someone that's in our in our educator network. And so um, it just continues to grow and blossom, and it's <laughs> it's a lifetime or multiple lifetimes of <laughs> of exploring, you know? Yeah. Um, are there some examples you mentioned, um, you know, bringing fungi into these different systems in agroforestry to encourage tree growth? 
Um, are there some other examples um, or other ways that that mycelium can can serve us in within agroforestry systems? Yeah, I mean, I I think it, there's it's, it's unknown territory, right? So we there's mycorrhizal fungi which are partnering and exchanging um, nutrients and minerals in the soil, and really are are down in the soil, you know, harvesting and sharing those resources and cycling them. But then there's also decomposer fungi, which I think we we just sort of always kind of um, discount the, the the myriad of benefits. So um, mm-hmm. the decomposing fungi are amazing because we're, they're really the, the 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 organisms that can you know break down the lignans in wood. So they're the the start of the decomposition process. They're the only organism that can do that. And so um, when we think about soil building, we think about bringing a lot of woody material in. How do fungi play a role in helping break that down? And 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 potentially accelerating that process because I think soil building and bringing more organic matter to soils is something that you know most of the farms I interact with need, and and if we partner with fungi, I think we can find beneficial ways to do that. But um, the, the, you know the thing is they're always there, they're present, they're doing that work, and I think there's a lot of conversation about how to sort of accelerate that. Um, and look at that even on a broad acre. So there's large carbon sequestration projects that are looking at over thousands of acres. Are there ways that we can cultivate, you know, fungi and other microbes to break down and, and cycle carbon and, and that to be really the root of, of this whole conundrum? So we're just at the tip of the iceberg. And I think what we need are people to spend more time with fungi, to understand them and to plug into, you know, one of the arenas that... Um, that's available and and dig in because we have a lot more questions and answers at this point in terms of those kind of those kind of benefits and what it really looks like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I th- I think so often about the um, is it millions, thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of different um, fungi species, yeah. and just this very very small number that we know and eat and love, and and just the possibilities seem endless yeah. <laughs> yeah. for in developing that relationship. Um, so thinking sort of beyond the the mushroom, um, and we talked a little bit about how growing mushrooms can be part of encouraging this carbon cycle and soil growth. Um, what, how else do you think of growing mushrooms in terms of being a really integrated part of your forest farming system? I think a big way is um, the sort of post-production life of the material. So we have, you know, piles of spent logs around the farm and we have uh, block sawdust or straw blocks that we're producing indoors that come out into the farm. And, and those are not a waste product. They're actually a, a high protein, um, carbon rich uh, substrate that we're trying to think about creative ways to utilize. Um, one thing that's just happened is a lot of our old shiitake logs have have been um, inoculated just sort of naturally by turkey tail. So that's been fun because a lot of the turkey tail we've been able to harvest in the last few years has just come off those logs. So so there's an interesting question because we know that, for instance, shiitake are primary decomposers. And once they're done um, with their work, there's still food in there that secondary decomposers want to get in on, which, you know, the turkey tail mm-hmm. would be one of those. So is there ways to cycle that through, you know, as a second thing, or, or is it just kind of a natural phenomenon that we can enjoy? But I, that's kind of where we're thinking about is, you know, we have all this material, we're kind of creating lots of organic materials, and we could just throw it in a pile and it'll become compost, and that's fine, but there might be ways we could, you know, really um, increase its utility on the farm and, and with some intention and some some um, some production. So, uh, like worm composting is another great example that worms really love to use the spent blocks um, and and you can make a really nice kind of vermicompost from them. Um, they've spent substrates have been used for animal feed um, in the past. So um, mm. we're considering what that would look like. You know, we've tried to feed some to the sheep and they're certainly not like <laughs> going crazy for it. But um, I think if we had like uh, spent grain or something, you know, with mycelium, they would uh-huh. they would be interested. But I don't think sawdust is, yeah. is so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You do have ducks in with your shiitakes too, right? For eating slugs, is that the benefit? Yeah, we yeah we did a grant years ago and and looked at the sort of cycling them through and trying to figure that out. And um, we still do that. Um, sort of, it's you don't want to have the ducks in at the same time the mushrooms are fruiting because of food safety concerns. Mm-hmm. So it's like more 
uh, clean out in the spring, like knock the population back, because the slugs are all waiting in the soil and doing their thing. Um, so that, that we found that to be effective, and then we can kind of bring them into the woods, like fence out the logs that are fruiting and, and bring them in, and we do see some positive results from that. So... Um, yeah, it's a part of the part of the process. The the ducks like make their way around the farm, and mainly, and their their job is pest control and and fertility. You know, so they do a great job with that. Nice. Yeah. Are there any other lessons learned that you'd want to share about your experience growing mushrooms? Um, there's so many lessons learned. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, no, I don't think there's anything in particular. I think the, back to your question about like why, why log grown or why outside, because we could grow shiitakes indoors. Um, but Mm -hmm. I, I, the quality that comes off of the logs and also just the experience as a grower, like heading out into the woods in the morning and harvesting in that nice morning light is, is so enjoyable. And, um, and pulling, you know, you pull your shade cloth off the log and you just see these, these beautiful mushrooms that, um, have mm-hmm. been going away like that's it, it kind of speaks to like the ideal of what i would imagine all farming is like which is not what it's like but, <laughs> but that's why we do it because we really enjoy you know spending time outside and doing that be sure to check out the specialty mushrooms resources with the cornell small farms program linked in this episode's show notes Steve Gabriel and other mushroom growers featured there have shared so much insight about cultivating edible and medicinal fungi. Here in Missouri, Ozark Forest Mushrooms is where I send people who are interested in seeing what a thriving forest-grown shiitake operation can look like. Nicola McPherson runs the show there. She's an inspiration to new fungi farmers, not only for her ability to grow mushrooms, but also for her skill at turning them into value-added products that sell throughout the state. She shared about her shiitake setup at the Center for Agroforestry's annual symposium. So I'm going to welcome you to Ozark Forest Mushrooms. I've been in business for 30 years this year. Um, As you can tell, I'm a British woman growing Japanese mushrooms in the Ozark Forest. Nobody ever forgets me. And I met my husband in England. He was doing a junior year abroad program um, at the same university I was studying um, environmental sciences. So that explains why I'm here. Um, I'm very fortunate he has a family farm. Uh, It's located in the Ozarks, not far from the new Echo Bluff State Park. Um, It's a family farm. It has uh, Sinking Creek, a wonderful creek that actually cuts through a cave on the farm. We started off doing timber uh, farming on the farm because most of the farm is, I'd say, 80% forest land. Uh, The whole family farm is somewhere around 2,000 acres. We own about 500 of those acres. And so it's a great resource for my business to source the logs for my oak log shiitake mushroom production. So originally we did harvest a lot of the wood from the farm and uh, we use a timber standard improvement TSI program and uh, we would mark the trees and selectively harvest which does not encourage clear cut. We we come in, we take the tree trunks, they may go to stave bolts or the sawmills and then What's so wonderful about shiitake mushroom production, we use the the whole tree. So we can come in with my cordwood cutters. They're all local guys I hire. And um, they can then use the branch wood of what we prefer is white oak. White oak has a bark that stays on the trees, which we like for mushroom growing. And it also has a wonderful um, amount of sapwood to heartwood ratio. Sapwood's got all the goodies and carbohydrates that the shiitake mushroom mycelium like to digest to grow the mushrooms. Right now, we're not cutting wood on the farm because uh, we did do an, a forest audit. We cannot cut there for several more years until the forest recovers. So right now, we're very lucky. Our next door neighbors are Pioneer Forest, which was one of the largest um, forest landowners in Missouri. They have over 100,000 acres. So we're sourcing some of the wood from them and also from a plot um, with the uh, Missouri Department of Conservation as well. 
So uh, the other thing you can do, so we kind of added va a value to our cordwood by growing mushrooms. So I pay like 65 cents for each piece of cordwood to the cordwood cutters. And then if you work it out, I get maybe a pound of mushrooms, give or take, from each log. I get like not quite 10 bucks a pound for the shiitakes, and I get mushrooms for about three years off that log. So think of the added value of growing mushrooms on that cordwood. During the symposium, I took the opportunity to chat with Nicola McPherson to catch up and to learn more about her story. How did you discover mushrooms as an, uh, a possibility for your farm? Well, when I first met my husband uh, in England, he, we went to his farm in the Ozarks and he had been to an alternative farming conference in Kansas City and had learned that the Ozarks is not dissimilar to northern Japan. We have a wealth of scrub oak. We don't have the best trees in the world in the Ozarks. And that we have a wealth of water, spring water. And um, it's a perfect recipe for growing uh, shiitakes. And we got the labor. I mean, everybody in the Ozarks is either cordwood cutters, they're homesteaders, and they got good, great work ethic. So I think that's how it kind of, as I always say, mushroomed <laughs> from, you know, 10 logs to 100 to 1,000. And now we're doing six, 7,000 logs a year. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and you've been uh, doing this for a while. Just thinking, years. thinking about how much the mushroom industry has mm -hmm. grown in the time that you've been doing right. this. You know, you're, you're filling a niche. Have you seen people around you start to get excited about mushrooms because of what you're oh, doing? Oh, I think mushrooms are certainly very popular right now. Yeah. Um, and I think people um, want to cook their own food again because we went through an era where people didn't know how to cook anything. And I think with all the food shows and um, Instagram recipes, cooking, food booths, food trucks, people are getting into the local food movement big time. And, um, and they're very supportive of what I do. And I never not sell everything. And if I don't, I make it into a value-added food product. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> so it, it all moves. Yeah. And I, I think as a businesswoman, uh, you, it makes sense to yeah. do that. And then in the l slower times, like right now in the winter, I sell more dried mushrooms because people want dried mushrooms because of soups and stocks and yeah. ramen noodle dishes. <laughs> yeah. You know, the story is the 93 flood when we had a massive fruiting of rather wet, damp shiitakes and I didn't want to throw them away. So we got into drying them. So as an accidental value added food product, I hadn't planned it. And so out of disaster, opportunity knocks, right? So we started off with the dried shiitakes and kind of realized a lot of customers don't really know how to use dried mushrooms. So then we came up with the, uh, the Asian style meals in a box um, to help people learn how to use dried mushrooms. So we had the, the Japanese Buddhist delight, the monsoon mushroom, which is Indian, and then the jungle curry, which is a Thai themed. Uh, meal. Yeah, nice. And there were other things you're making a soy yeah. sauce and well, the that, soup mixes. Yeah, I know. So we started yeah. with the dried mushrooms and then we made some dried mushroom blends. I bought in other dried mushrooms from uh, mushroom vendors that are, um, you know, approved and good source um, and blended some of the dried mushrooms and made like medicinal dried mushrooms with my shiitakes and oysters. And then I made a woodland medley mix too. Um, and I think once people learned how to use dried mushrooms, then my dried mushroom sales then went up. So now the, the best buy now is the dried mushrooms, not just the meals. There's one meal that they love the best, which is the Buddha's delight, because we serve that at the Japanese festival. So we, we then moved on, uh, like, what am I going to do with all these stalks and pieces that are perfectly okay, they just might not look pretty. So we came up with this mushroom soy sauce idea, where you marinate them in the soy sauce and, and then uh, strain it and bottled it up. And that makes a, a nice uh, complement to the rest of my Asian products. So we kind of got a little Asian theme going there. 
And then uh, we also make a mushroom powder called a mushroom rub, where we blend um, um, the shiitakes and oysters, and we threw in some porcini powder, which I buy in, and some herbs and some salt, um, and in a spice jar. So that, that sells well. Um, and we mostly sell these products at farmers markets and a few specialty food stores. We're not in um, the supermarkets. We used to be a long time ago, but it's, it's, it's just not my scene. And um, I like to sell direct. I, I, like I said, you, you meet your customer and then you find out what they like or what they don't understand or you work out that's not moving, so maybe don't do that anymore. So I find that really helpful doing the farmers markets and then people recognize our name because we sell a lot of fresh mushrooms to restaurants in the area. And so there's that name recognition. You see them, us on a fresh uh, a menu in a restaurant and then you see us at the farmers market and, and you can buy the value added products and associate it with gourmet, it's, so to speak. Um, and then we branched out into truffle butter. We do um, have a little truffle orchard on the farm. We haven't yet to pick any, but I do buy in truffles and make my own truffle butter. Um, and then we got a grant for a mobile greenhouse and then all the composted oyster bags, we make mushroom compost and then we incorporate that in our raised beds and then we grow um, uh, oriental spicy greens, sorrel, um, arugula, um, more unusual greens. I'm not going to be growing lettuce and think. Try, I try and grow something that other people aren't. But the, all the products kind of go together. Yeah, um, yeah. I think people like buying from the, the farmer direct. You can check out Ozark Forest Mushrooms products at ozarkforest.com. Or you can pay Nicola McPherson a visit by staying at the Beaver Lake Guest House on their Ozark farm. In gratitude for the magic and wisdom of fungi, may this spring offer abundant harvest for you, both wild and cultivated. Thanks, as always, to Tim Pilcher, who helps produce this podcast, and to these experienced growers and educators, Steve Gabriel and Nicola McPherson. Our theme music is the work of farmer Noah Earle. Stay tuned for more agroforestry conversations and connections by subscribing to the Agroforestry Podcast on any podcast app.